Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my great pleasure to welcome uh, my next guest on the Quantum Leap 24 hour non stop business show going around the world today. And uh, I'd love to welcome to the program Liz Brewer. Hello, Liz. Hello, John. <laughs> What, uh, what a great pleasure to have you on the program. And uh, um, I know uh, there's a few things that I'd like to get into today and have a little chat uh, about, particularly your uh, interesting life and, and uh, you'll hear your views on uh, running businesses during times of inter un uh, interruption as well as uh, when it's all smooth sailing. So Liz, you're a world renowned event planner. Um, and events have been absolutely decimated by COVID. How have you dealt with that? And what tips or strategies would, uh, could you share uh, with people that are in similar businesses to yourself? Well, it was an extraordinary coincidence because I had been uh, asked to write my, my memoirs, my book. And um, it's something I thought would, doing the research, probably take about three or four weeks, and then I could start writing. And I'd had a meeting before the lockdown, and uh, so I had this plan. Well, I have to tell you, I started the day of lockdown, again, thinking it would be a matter of weeks, and I'm still going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And in actual fact, um, for some unbeknown reason, I had kept absolutely everything. I have a lot of room in my house and storage bunkers downstairs. And I went to get all the old files and there were boxes and boxes of the old clients. And I went through them and a few have disappeared, but many are still relevant today. And uh, I started going through it. And of course I have about 200 approximately of the old fashioned albums, photograph albums. I used to photograph everything. Yep. I still do, but of course nowadays we don't make those albums. We rely on sort of the photographs that we put on our phones or on social media. And so sadly I stopped about 10 years ago. However, I still have a, a record, but I've really gone up to about 10 years and I, in fact, relived my life. So for me, it was a question. And if you remember, we had fabulous weather. I would take boxes out in the garden and fill sacks of stuff that was irrelevant. I needed to keep sort of everything that backs up what I'm writing because some of it, you know, is fairly unbelievable. And I was very fortunate in life. I had a huge amount of luck. I think it's because I always had a goal. I kept going. And if I decided I had to achieve something, I just went on until I did. And I had fabulous clients and all of them were either pioneers or unique in some way. And I think one, I know one of your questions was when dealing with that, that type of client, um, luminaries, how did I feel? And I didn't give it that much thought. I know that sounds very strange, but if I go back to when, I mean, I'm going back 30, 32, 33 odd years, when I was cold called by Ivana Trump, Donald's first wife and mother of his three significant children. And she called me, she just got divorced and invited me to Harry's Bar Club, uh, dining club in London. And I was curious, I mean, um, she didn't know many people in this country. We had a few friends in common in Europe and in America. And I suppose it was, I was curious as to what she felt or what she needed. At the back of my mind, I sort of vaguely knew because at that time the fashions were very short and very flouncy and she was, and her hairstyle was unusual and it was very high and uh, there, were, there were things that I sort of felt she'd been doing wrong. So it was a question of guiding, advising. Anyway, it's a long story, she's still my client today. And it, it really was organizing everything, introducing to her 
people as she was going to spend a lot of time in this country who she could relate to on the same level. And yep. We Brits are rather reserved. It takes a long time to get to know new friends and uh, there are so many shortcuts. So because of that, going to that meeting and that lunch with that fascination of what, what does she want? Um, it, it didn't sort of occur to me to think, well, how do I feel? This woman is world famous. She's an absolute icon, virtually running a lot of Donald's businesses at that time, you're know, forced to be reckoned with. And I learned a huge amount from her, especially att attention to detail. And so what you, what you see in a person of that, that sort of character and that success is a human being. And you always have to remember behind closed doors, you know, cut them, they bleed. They're the yep. same as you and, and, and I am. And, and therefore, I think I would always, when I look at somebody, I see the human being and I see them, you know, for what they are. I've always felt people's energy. I've had that it's a it's not a gift it's something you develop and i think that came from years of living in portugal when i observed people i was very young and i observed them and watched them and could read their energy and it's something to this day i've found quite useful yeah yes so uh, those who past experiences have uh, have helped you uh, helped you through because i know you've worked with some pretty famous people like Tom Jones and Richard, Sir Richard Branson. Um, but how, how, how is it just a word of mouth? Is it, uh, you know, for people out there looking to get, you know, key cl clients, how does that all come about? It's quite extraordinary. It just happens. And I've never advertised. It's only ever been word of mouth. And, you know, I love a challenge. And, um, when I've been approached, and you mentioned Tom Jones, Tom was never a client of mine, but I did know him. But with people, for example, like Richard Branson, it was a question of, I would be approached and to do something. And maybe it was a test to see, well, let's see what she can do. And that often happened. It would start off with me being asked to do an event or three challenges. And uh, I always remember one client that was slightly more recent um, who just wanted three things ha happen. He wanted a heliport in the Thames. He wanted to be a member of a new club in London, a real um, elitist club and uh, memberships closed. And the third one was to do a party at Ascot for about 80 people at the last moment and have access to the royal enclosure now these are things that everybody says it's impossible but i learned in life nothing is impossible if you put your mind to it and if you've got the right connections there's somebody there who can help and you have to start off with the attitude okay I'm going to try and do this. I'm going to give it my best shot. And, and you focus on it. And every phone call, everything you do during the day, everything's focusing on that one thing. And nine times out of 10, you manage to do it. Yep. And, and I would surprise myself with, you know, okay, this club is closed membership. There's no way I'm ever, but I don't have that. I went, following day invited to lunch the son of the guy i was having lunch with happened to be helping the membership secretary and uh, it happened i went i can't go into details of how it happened but it happened in three days and that i found in life you know you have to believe rather than have the negative approach you'll be optimistic and believe you can make it happen if you start doubting then you know, and those negative thoughts creep in. You won't succeed in anything. Yep, and uh, and very wise words. I've um, interviewed a people you may not know, not uh, Alan Peace uh, from the Body Language uh, series, ah, yeah. and 
And Alan, uh, who I've known for many years, uh, quoted, it's uh, you work out the what and then don't lay, let the how sayers stop you doing it. And I guess that's... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> a little, little bit like Richard Branson's book with Screw It, uh, Just Do It. You say yes and then work out how to do it afterwards. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And, you know, and it is like, um, because I, one of your other questions was about you know, doing television and filming. Well, I mean, I, I've had two documentaries made on me, both by the BBC. First one was 20 years ago. No, actually it was over 30 years ago. And I've done filming even before that, you know, when I was very young. And to begin with, um, because I took on projects where, you know, I was, focused on and I had to give a speech or a talk or be filmed. Yes, I used to get, in the beginning I was nervous. And I remember one day I was putting on the first big charity event I ever did in this country, which was in the seventies and uh, for the Council for the Protection of Royal England, it was the England Board. And I remember getting my entire committee together, which I had about 30 people all in their own right, quite, quite well known, and would, were integral to what I was trying to achieve. And um, I was at a venue and I had to give my speech and I had always had a little flask of whiskey. I was taking a slug of whiskey. <laughs> Somebody saw me and said to my sister, I've just seen your sister take some slug of whiskey. And she said, she always does that before she does a speech. Well, I discovered I didn't need to do that in the end. You know, you, you, what you have to do is forget and just concentrate on what you've got to say, who's out there. You know, it can be an audience of millions of people or it can be dozens of people, or indeed it can be a dozen, you know, six to... And it's a question of you talking, believing in what you're saying, integrity i think is terribly important so you have to believe in what you're saying if you don't you know people can read through you and and also if you don't believe in a project um you're not going to do it particularly well you're going to do it because you're going to be paid to do it many clients i i remember one in particular who i turned down um and i'd say look i'm very expensive and, you know, going back 30, 40 years, I was the most expensive you could have. And, but I, you know, I, I, I did give, give what, what was expected. But with this particular club, I never forget, um, he wanted me to open a, um, the first of the chain, a very well-known hamburger restaurant. And I just said, look, it's not my market. Yep. I can't do it. And you know, the first hamburger restaurant just opened in London and, and I said, no, <laughs> and he went on and on and on in this room. And yeah. finally, just to get rid of him, I said, I can't do it. But I can guarantee September that day, nobody's going to be here, they're all away. And he said, I don't care, I want you to do it. I couldn't sleep. And I remember getting up three in the morning I had one of those old fashioned typewriters. I typed him a letter and said, you know, I can't, I really can't take your money to do this because I'm not going to be able to achieve what you want. You know, and uh, got in my car, drove up to Hampstead, popped it through his letterbox, came back, went to sleep. He's banging on my door at nine in the morning. He said, you gave your word. <laughs> Okay. Well, I went into overdrive. I, 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 because he wanted 150 guests, I invited at least 300, thinking everybody would be away. I even invited the local mayor, it was in Covent Garden, the Pearly King and Queen. I did, at that time, I was very friendly with Marvin Gaye through uh, another friend of mine, Lady Edith Foxwell, and I, they were coming. And so I had that up my sleeve. But I remember that particular day, 9th, I'll never forget, 9th of September, 
we are going back a long, long time. And it would appear everybody had just arrived back from holiday, had a tan, felt great, wanted to party. And mine may have been the only invitation going, but they all turned up. Yep. To the extent that there were also three Rolls Royces that got towed away. So, of course, it hit the headlines. <laughs> this <laughs> amazing restaurant. Um, many stories about that particular club because, of course, it went on and on and on. And um, very amusing stories as well, which, of course, will all be in the book because what I've done over the last, at least the last 12 months, is um, I've managed to reduce the filing. If you could see my drawing room, it is boxes of now very large files and masses of press cuttings, et cetera, in order for me to select those that have amusing stories. And there are amusing stories to tell because I sort of feel nobody's particularly interested in the fact that I've had hundreds of clients and who they are, and they might not even know half of them, but what they want is something that they could relate to, a people that they still know about and you have to make it amusing. When everybody can laugh, they laugh with you, you know, rather than find it offensive. Yep. And, and many uh, businesses today, whether it's uh, the interesting uh, stories that you've had, Liz, or whether it's a day to day, what most people would consider even a mundane uh, situation that happens to all of us in business, people can relate. And, and when you tell the, the story of what happened, everybody thinks, yep, that's, that's, all, uh, that's authentic. And I think uh, authentic, uh, authenticness uh, is, is something that a lot of people look for. They certainly do, especially where in business. One of the most important qualities with people is it's honesty, integrity. Um, yeah, I'm all for ambition. You know, when you're interviewing people, you want somebody who they may not have the top qualifications, but if they've got an honesty about them, if they've got if they're eager, they want to participate, they have the ambition and will to work with you. I think that's more important than anything else. You know, you go back to my parents' generation when you know, people had apprentices, you started at the bottom and you worked your way up. I mean, that's what happened and, and it worked. Um, so they learned, they learned communication, communicating with people. Yep. And you asked me about you know, this, this last year that we've all had and the lockdowns. What's happened is of course, people have realized one of the most important things is human contact and not just through a Zoom. It's actually being able to feel the energy to be with other people. And we were actually, we were becoming, especially the young, we were becoming the creatures that continually were looking down, you know, blocking the ears. And once it was taken away, you know, it took us three or four weeks, but the panic sort of set in and they realized you can't live your life like that. You've got to have, we're animals. We need contact with other human beings. Yep. And again, a lot of people probably don't realize it, but you, you know, you don't get that through a Zoom or through having a phone conversation. You get it by actually being in the room with that other person and feeling their energy. Yes. And uh, I'm a great believer in, in energy and positive energy. I was once in Thailand, um, um, a place called Shiva Som. I've got a photograph here somewhere. And I had my aura photographed. And I didn't even know you could do that. It was quite extraordinary. It was a special camera, Korean camera. And um, the, the current sort of goes through you. The night before this had happened, I had been, um, I'd gone out to dinner. There happened to be at this particular place she was on, unexpectedly, three people that I knew. Um, and three significant people, let's put it like that. 
And um, we ganged up and we went out, we crept out to have dinner and we had champagne, which we shouldn't have done because at that time, this particular place was very much into health and was yeah. detoxing, etc. So disobeying the rules and we had our champagne. And um, I could probably tell you who they are. One was Mark Burley, who's now dead, who started the big club Annabelle's, most famous club in the world. And the other was uh, Evelyn de Rothschild, who's just gone through a divorce. And the other was a, a, a friend, um, married to a girlfriend of mine, um, Billick, and uh, Izzy Billick, uh, hello, Joseph L. Hello. And so we were out, four of us, five of us. Well, the, the following day when this grand master came to um, photograph our auras, we all went along and lined up and we had the photograph done. And I remember thinking at the time, I'm going to make my energy positive. You know, I feel like, because I still feel the champagne. <laughs> so, so a, bit of, a bit of courage. Absolutely. Changing my, um, my energy, being positive. And if I could reflect on one moment of my life when I felt absolutely incredible, was when that guy came out. This little man, his white hair, these two guys, and he was in a long robe, and he, he must have been in his 80s. I had no idea who I was, what I did, and he just looked at the photograph, and he said, this girl, I should call me Elizabeth. <laughs> and there was Mark and Evie and Joseph and, and another person, Andrew Candle. And, and he said, you have a very unusual aura, come with me. And I floated up <laughs> in front of, you know, these, these you know, very grown up men. And uh, I floated out and then he started to tell me things that nobody knew, uh, but maybe he said, you have the power of persuasion, make absolutely certain you learn to use it well and not just to your advantage. And they were very wise words. And I often, I reflect on that time and I remember those words because sometimes, you know, you can sometimes see an easy route to something and it might benefit you. And then you have to think of the whole picture. Well, that's okay, but you have to sometimes be slightly more unselfish. And in the end, it's more rewarding. Yep. Liz, that, uh, that segues nicely into the next question I'd like to ask, and that surrounds in charitable causes and whatnot. And I know you're uh, pretty heavily involved, as are most of the people I'm interviewing on this show. One of the things they have in common, other than being nice people and, and uh, accommodating and happy, is that, is that they're all involved in some uh, philanthropy of some kind. Can you just share where, you know, what you're involved in and what... Uh, what occurs as a result of that? Yeah, I've been involved in many, many charities. Um, it was just something which, unfortunately, we seem to have quite a void in this country to, to fund. And um, so a lot of it has to be done through you know, events and with private individuals, etc. And I mean, so many. And one of the things that astounds me. I remember the last charity I actually launched. I launched two. Um, one was many years ago, about 30 years ago, was the research into ovarian cancer. And that was because a particular friend of mine, um, she had recovered from ovarian cancer. And that was through um, someone who was doing research using mercury and all kinds of things. And this uh, my a girlfriend of mine and her husband wanted to be able to start uh, uh, a charity to, to further her research. I remember that. And then the next time I launched was with um, Life After Breast Cancer. Again, the same girlfriend had had a double mastectomy. And I, what I wanted to do is, I, because of that, I suddenly discovered that an awful lot of my friends have had this. 
unbeknown to me, unbeknown to the world at large, and um, fantastic women. And there is life after. A lot of them I didn't realize, and a lot of them, again, were the doers of this world. And, and so I, I, I launched Life After Breast Cancer under the umbrella of another um, charity. And doing that, I discovered there were an awful lot of charities, in actual fact, doing similar things. Now, what needs to happen in the, the world of fundraising and charity is that a lot of these need to get together and they need to combine their efforts. When I suggest in the past, I've got the, the feeling that they felt, oh, well, we'll lose out. We'll have to divide the proceeds. But my experience is that that's incorrect because I did an event actually with uh, Walking with the Wounded, which at the time was something Prince Harry had, um, had attached himself to. And I put on a big event to raise funds for that particular charity in conjunction with another charity. And it not only worked, but what happens is you actually capitalize on getting to a larger audience. And it's not just what you make from that event. And it's important that you do make money out of those events. Otherwise, it's, you know, you feel that you're wasting your time. But what happens is you spread the word, but also other private individuals come in and they, they do give generously. So one of the things I think that people need to do in the world of charities actually to look into what other charities are similar and how they could combine their efforts. Because I think it would be far more rewarding. Yep. Well, and, uh, you know, I speak on a number of subjects and collaboration is certainly one of them. And you get one plus one equaling three and economies of scale. So uh, I fully, uh, fully concur. And uh, hopefully some of the charities that are watching out there can take something uh, from that particular, um, that particular uh, idea. Uh, Liz, you know, you've been involved with so many different things. What an interesting, you know, I'd love to have a, you know, a, an all day interview with some of the things that you've done, but you've, you've been involved with marketing entire countries like Greece, Portugal and Jamaica uh, with the travel industry, which is pretty uh, hard hit, obviously out there. And we've got a lot of people in that space that will be watching uh, this particular uh, segment. What would be your number one tip for any destination? that wants to get up and running again uh, as quickly as they possibly can. You know, it's very important. When you go to a country, you A, need to know about the culture. You need to know about their customs. It helps if you have a few words of their language, but of course, nowadays you can have an app on your phone to do the translating. But it is important because in some countries, they're, traditions or their habits are very different to ours and they could get insulted. One of the things which I pointed out the other day on the program was about tipping. You go to Japan and tip and they virtually throw it back at you. Yep. <laughs> you know, uh, you do that in this country and you probably, you know, get the food thrown back at you. Yep. But so you, most important of the countries or for any business involved in the travel industry is that initial welcome how you approach the the client to begin with and you know uh, it's when you arrive when you're made to feel welcome and that you don't have to um spend hours trying to have your visa looked at or your passport some or other a lot of this needs to be simplified and done in a way whereby when you arrive you are you feel as if you are wanted and, yep. are wanted. and it's something which is, seems to have slipped right down the scale you go to some of those tropical islands and it was wonderful they greet you you know with a rum punch or whatever and put garlands over you but it's the, and I'm not talking about cities, uh, because they're, you know, the business of inter 
are communicating with other cities and traveling. To, that's, you know, something which will happen in any case. What we're talking about, I presume, is the traveler. Yes. The traveler, it needs to be made simpler so that when you're packing, you know exactly what you're going to need for that destination. You need to know, you, uh, you need, as, it, as, it, as if it were, some sort of itinerary to tell you um, where you should visit and, and why. Yep. So I think that would be so that you have a sort of a crib sheet of, so, uh, to be able to refer to where you're going. And yep. as I say, also with some of the customers. So that uh, that's probably a good tip for anybody in business generally as well, as if you make your customer easy enough to do business with and welcome when they uh, first encounter you, that's, uh, that can transpose over that as well. You have to remember that word of mouth here with with travel industry, word of mouth and hearing from other people and uh, with social media, et cetera, is very important. You upset a, a holiday or somebody who's on holiday and um, they're going to make it known. So yeah. it's very important. Liz, um, you've worked with uh, brands like Galaxy and, and you did a little segment there on mistletoe kissing etiquette. I did. What, what was all that about? Well, Galaxy brought out a bar of chocolate kisses and they decided, they brought it out at Christmas a few years ago and they decided they were going to, to test people about their mistletoe kissing. And so they brought me in, they did a little booklet which was attached to every bar of my hints on mistletoe kissing and how you should go about it, etc. And um, because that sparked off things like office parties, what you should do and shouldn't do, etc. But it was all to do with really explaining uh, the history of mistletoe and why it had happened and how you should kiss. And they even had a girl all dressed in red going around the streets of London with me with a mistletoe uh, offering the kisses to anybody that would kiss her. Couldn't do that nowadays, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like on the Gold Coast in Queensland, where I'm from, and they had uh, meter maids. So they'd go around with, uh, you know, change, and if your meter expired, instead of getting booked, they'd uh, pop it in the, in the uh, in meter for you and give you more time. What a good idea. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Liz, uh, etiquette is it social behaviour and etiquette's uh, been your forte subjects of, uh, dare I say it, uh, spanning five decades now. What's changed, especially with social media? And what would you say are the couple of do's and don'ts uh, on social media? What would be one or two things that, that you would do and one or two things that you'd certainly avoid if you could possibly help it? Well, in actual fact, I mean, had you asked me that question, you know, 18 months, 16 months ago, I might have given you a different answer, but nowadays the social media has actually kept things going and people have been able to communicate in some form or other, even though there's been a lot of um, historical events being put on. But in actual fact, in my, believe it or not, in my, uh, my last book, no, my second book, um, which I wrote for the millennium, which was before people really got into huge amounts of social media. And I remember at that time writing a page on what did I think of social media and that sort of interaction. And I remember saying, I think it is a brilliant tool, but you have to learn to use it wisely. And it's not a substitute for life. And I still believe that to this day. And I, I, I truly believe that it's a brilliant tool, but as I said, it's not a substitute for life. So when I wrote that, I'm not quite sure how I knew that at the time, but uh, to this day, and you know, I wrote that book, well, for the millennium, so we're going back 20 years and, uh, and and yet I still feel that's absolutely the case. Yep. Liz, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you uh, you started uh, a hospitality business when you were tw uh, 21 years old and four people that uh, you obviously knew invested in you what um, what would be your advice for anyone there that's looking for investment in whatever idea it is that they've uh, that they've got up how do you attract uh, people to you you have to be absolutely honest you have to have integrity if you're a first timer it's a bit like being you know publishing your first book they've got nothing to judge you by so they are going to judge you by how you present yourself um, if you've done a business plan how you've done it but it is you that they're investing in so they're going to you know, take note of your energy and your enthusiasm. And as I said before, your integrity, your honesty. Um, you know, with a lot of people, they don't give much of themselves during a conversation or during an interview. And you have to understand that from the moment you walk in that door and there's a panel of people or people sitting there, um, they're judging you. And it Sometimes they don't know why. And as I say, that's to do with this energy. We have an aura around us and that is having an intercourse, as it were, with the people sitting in front of you. So, you, you know, you have to make certain that A, that what you're doing, you are genuinely interested in and focused on and the enthusiasm. It's the enthusiasm. Um, which is infectious and with that it was a, cl a club in Portugal in the Algarve and um, before there were any discotheque clubs it was actually uh, two people and uh, they just saw that the they saw they had the vision to see beyond that little business at a time when there was nothing. And I, funnily enough, I've just completed the files on the Algarve and that club in Albufera, seven, seven and a half, and what we went through. And it is an extraordinary story. At a time when this was a police run state, I didn't know anything about the politics of Portugal. Yep. So it was a learning experience, but you could see, and those people that invested could see this area was going to be developed. There were going to be hotels. There's going to be an airport. You know, it was going to be massive. And there was this little hub of um, a nightclub and a discotheque. And it did take 600 people a night, the upstairs and the downstairs. And funnily enough, it's where I sort of began this extraordinary journey because um, Cliff Richards came down, Lou Grade here, you know, what if, people who owned the business he was involved in um, had built two houses and he put Cliff Richards in one and he put the group called the Shadows in another and uh, I of course met them and uh, Cliff used to come down to the club in the afternoons and teach me the latest dances and so this little gem this little club had a huge amount of publicity and I mean in those days there weren't that many magazines or newspapers and probably only three or four television channels unlike today so whatever you did got highlighted and the and the word spread and and I have to admit going through the press cuttings and the letters and the photographs just of that, I mean, I've still got hundreds of files, unfortunately, but with those ones, going through and reliving, as it were, my life in my, now in my mind, as it was, you look back and you, th I, I do think, how did I do it? Yeah. But I did, because you learned as you went along, you knew very little, but you had the vision and Every time you came to a problem, you got over it and somehow it cleared and then you went on to the next problem. 
and and it was a learning experience and it was very much a learning experience for me to know single-handedly how I could do this and make a success of it and I have to say <laughs> I was the money changer and um, not only was the, I was the money changer in those days and I used to take the money and then roll it up into silver paper and send it back to my mother. I'm going back a long time, we put it in my bank account. But I also bought contraband because although at that time, the Portuguese were fairly backward going back to the 60s and 70s. And, uh, you know, they actually, they, I don't think they even made bicycles. They could make good wine and port and corks. But otherwise, a lot, everything seemed to be sort of brought into the country. And um, I do remember buying contraband whiskey, but knowing that at the end of the night, the bottles would have to be smashed, put in a sack, and one of my ch chef de bars um, would row out and plunk them in over, overboard. So to this day, off the coast of Albufera will be thousands of sacks of broken glass, which are probably now all moulded into one or whatever. Well, there might be a, a worthwhile diving uh, exhibition, uh, ex <laughs> exhibition down there. Yeah. Liz, Liz, my favourite story, I think, on when I did a little bit of research with you was a combination of uh, great skill, determination, a little bit of luck, great timing, was the, the time you opened to the club in Mayfair. Can you give us, uh, would, would oh. you like to share the uh, the story of uh, surrounding that and how you went from the sublime to the ridiculous fairly quickly? <laughs> yeah. Well, um there were two years, or there was one year when I was in Portugal, when there was a lot of movement going on and it was prior to the revolution. And I remember at the time, um, it, it was uncomfortable and I closed the club. Um, there, was, there was a big one downstairs and a little one upstairs, discotheque upstairs, and there was performance and singing downstairs. So I closed it, came back to this country, and I opened a small club with a friend in Shepherd's Bush. It, was, it, it had existed, I think it was called something like the Black Sheep, but I turned it again into seven, seven and a half. And because there was so many fans who had come from uh, London and UK, I, and I had had a lot of publicity. I, I didn't think it would be too difficult to open it up and fill it. And there was a young guitarist, black guitarist. And he was arrived in London and he'd been there for a while. He'd made a record or two. And in those days, you know, they had these little singles as well as the LPs. He brought this single out and he came down to this club, which was uh, Shepherd's Bush. No, sorry, it wasn't Shepherd's Bush. It was um, it was in Mayfair. Um, trying to remember the name of the little area, tiny little area. I think of it in a minute. Anyway, he 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 came and and he started to play this guitar. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never seen anybody play a guitar as if they were really making love to a woman. And he wasn't really messing around. He, he was just extraordinary. And, um, and I remember we opened the club and um, he was playing every night. And I hadn't really done the opening. I think the opening party was about after about three or four days. Well, Within that time, his little single had gone into the charts and was it, it happened so fast. He was under contract and um, he was under contract for a month or two months. And it's a bit hazy, I can't remember, but of course his record had gone into the charts and word got out and his name was Jimi Hendrix, who you've probably heard of, and um, more than likely. 
and the 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 word spread like wildfire and suddenly Shep shepherd's market not shepherd, shepherd's market and suddenly there were people queuing up all around shepherd's market queuing up on the stairs including the rolling stones my brother who since i mean is my younger brother john who's in the uh, film industry has actually made a documentary on Jimi hendrix and it's included in that and he was there on the stairs and they were in those days were all wearing these sort of army coats with lots of medals and and this guy was playing and he was so extraordinary and so he was phenomenal and unfortunately the nasty man who owned the premises who rented them to me got so angry with all the people and i suppose understandable that he after one week by that time his record had gone to number one he turned off the electricity and there was nothing I could do. And I was so young at the time. I, nowadays, I'm sure you could bring in bands of lawyers and everything. But in those days, I mean, I had no idea what to do. And uh, it closed. And Jimmy went on to fame and fortune. And as I say, my brother, John, he made a film on Jimi Hendrix. And it mentions this, the club and um, it was an extraordinary time. And yep. then of course, I went back to Portugal. And, um... Yeah, it, it's probably my favourite story, having done, as I say, some research, because relating to a business, it's the vision to open the place. It's the little bit of luck getting the right person. You're just on top of things when nothing can possibly go wrong. And then the landlord turns off the electricity. So. <laughs> <laughs> so many people can relate to that type of story, and uh, I thought it was fascinating. The other extraordinary story which happened in Portugal, um, because you couldn't buy anything, I relied on friends to bring things out. And there was one young man who used to come out, and he used to work, I think the, he was a sort of used to go around plugging records for a company, I think it was called Polydor, and he worked for this company. It was wonderful. He'd come out sometimes twice a year and he'd bring me a whole collection of the top 10 and, and the albums. Absolutely wonderful. And stay in my house. I'd run out of bedrooms in the end. I had a wonderful cottage on the, on the cliff tops. And um, he had to share a bed with my chef de musica, a big girl who was also like a bodyguard. And she'd put cushions down the centre. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, I always remember, he was so wonderful. I'll tell you his name in a minute, but um, when the revolution happened in Portugal and I sold the club actually a couple of weeks before, and my brother at that time, who was mainly in the music industry, uh, he wanted to encourage me to go into the music industry with him. So I went, uh, and stayed at the Beverly Hills Hotel with him. And I went to a lot of the meetings, a lot of the parties. And one day ended up um, in Elton John's house on one of the hills. And um, by that time, I decided I didn't really understand this business and I didn't want to go into it anyway. So I wandered around the house and looking at the jukeboxes and photographs, I kept seeing these photographs. And I kept looking at them and thinking, I think I know that person. Anyway, by the end of the meeting, they came out and uh, I said, they said, were you okay? Yes, I said, but tell me something. There's a guy in that photograph that looks like somebody I know called John Reed. And they said, you don't know John Reed. I said, the guy in the photographs called John Reed. I know John Reed. And um, he was in New York. I was in Beverly Hills. It, so he rang John and uh, there was this sort of explosion because I'd lost him and uh, he'd obviously lost me. And so I said, John, haven't you done well? Because he was the guy that used to come and give me all these records, share uh -huh. them with my chef de musica. And of course we then reconnected in London and became great friends again. Yep but extraordinary and it was one of the bits of advice I used to give 
to, you know, I did six years of a series of trying to transform badly behaved young women into presentable ladies and uh, called Led It to Lady. And um, is one of the lessons I used to teach was never overlook where the person could be you know, in 10 years time that you're with, communicating with, doing business, come through your life, especially the young. And because you never know what's going to happen because there was little John Reed, as I knew him, this little Scotsman, and um, who <laughs> shared a bed in my house. Yep. And had very little who ended up, you know, the top of the tree. Um, yeah. So in life, life is strange and you never know where it's going to go. That's uh, so true. There's uh, for our American friends that are watching this, particularly the ones in Ohio, uh, they'll know uh, the song by the McCoys, Hang On Sloopy, which uh, has been enshrined by legislation in 1985 as their official state song. Um, that's where it probably all started for you. Um, how did you did you uh, get involvement in that as the only girl? Uh, how did that all come to be? Uh, good question. And you know, there's a lot of things in my life that I don't remember. They're slightly hazy. With that particular episode, and I know the Hang On Sloopy, and I know I was at that time. It was the time I was very much travelling around with my brother. However, that particular story will be in my book. And because I gather there are a million people out there wanting to know that story, because there have been a couple of other people um, who lay claim to that fame. But you're going to have to wait, because if I've got a million people wanting to know my story and how it happened, it's going to be in the book. Brilliant. What a great answer. And when I finish writing the book, which yep. is research has taken me now, um, it's taken me 14 months. Well, in actually writing, I've done two books, but uh, I should think hopefully by the autumn. Okay. And, and is it uh, public knowledge yet as to what the uh, name of this publication is going to be? The working title was going to be The Seven Lives of Liz. And then, you know, there's so many, because there are so many volumes to this book. And then I thought, well, behind closed doors, you know, could be, there are so many different um, working titles that keep changing. So it's we'll, going to be one of those wait and see. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to watch out. Yeah. Liz Brewer, it's been my absolute pleasure to have you uh, on the program today. And I'm sure that there's plenty of people out there from all walks of life that will take away some little tidbits of information that that uh, they can use, as well as the entertaining stories that you've got. So thank you very much for your uh, time today. And we really, really appreciate it. Thank you, John. Well, it's been a great pleasure for me, too. And I hope, yes, all your viewers enjoy it. Thank you.